celebrating his victory at the AVN. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. And I'll try and finish a little early because I know a lot of people have places to go tonight. But, uh, so we're going to talk about uh, tonight uh, TG100. And I'm just curious, how many uh, therapy physicists do we have in the room? Are we? Okay, so we're still the majority of which are therapy. We have a lot of diagnostic conversations. But, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this is more or less a therapy talk. Um, uh, ta AAPM Task Group 100 is on risk analysis uh, methodology, and uh, uh, if you didn't know that or hadn't heard of it, then you've probably been living under a rock for the last 40 years, because there's certainly been a lot of uh, talks and workshops and so forth on that. Um, but, but what I want to talk about tonight is how we have implemented it in our center at, in Oshner in, in New Orleans, which is a relatively small radiation oncology department. So we'll review TG100 fairly quickly. Uh, go over a few of the terminologies that's in there and their summary recommendations. We'll talk about some post efforts that are going on right now after the report was published, and uh, then we'll go right into what we've done in our center. So, uh, the Task Group 100, uh, which is entitled Application of Risk Analysis Methods for Radiation Therapy Quality Management, uh, was chaired by uh, Seifel Huck, who is the, the president of the AAPM, uh, Sniff Sniff. Uh, but, um, and has a number of uh, well-known uh, authors, as well as myself. And uh, actually, when this task group started, which was formed in 2003, it originally uh, was uh, put forth as a, uh, basically an evolution of task group 40, because task group 40 had sort of been dated on its recommendations for QA for uh, uh, various linear accelerator components. And the idea was that now we had dynamic wedges and multi-leaf collimators, and we needed uh, recommendations for those. And then uh, a couple of the task group members, uh, namely Jeff Williamson and uh, Nick Frost, said, hey, we really should look more at a theoretical framework for how to do risk analysis. Um, and the task group's charge evolved and became what was TG100. And then as a result, uh, TG142, for those of you who are familiar with that task group, uh, and I won't ask you the task group number in a Sam's question. Uh, TG142 then went on to fulfill the original uh, charge of TG100 and then supplemented the task group 40 recommendations with modern technologies. But task group 100 was more of a theoretical framework for how to develop QA procedures on uh, a prospective um, uh, method. So it's really combined in two parts. Part one is what you get when you go to the AAPM website. Part two is really uh, most of the appendices, which are quite large, which you can download there on um, your supplementary materials. But part one goes into the theory and justification, implementation guidelines, recommendations for users, for clinical users, vendors, the AAPM, for example, task group uh, authors and so forth, and regulators, and then has some examples and exercises. Um, first, some definitions in TG100 quality. Uh, TG100 defines quality as features which meet the needs of the patient that can be medical, psychological, or economic. Uh, also includes processes, uh, process which delivers a treatment in accordance with either national or internationally accepted standards and free from errors or mistakes. And failure is defined as not meeting some desired level of quality. Um, in defining quality, they naturally move into what we call a quality management program, and that we define as all activities that are designed to achieve some level of quality. And there are two components to a quality management program. You'll see quality control and quality assurance frequently within the report. And quality control is a procedure that verifies the status of a specific treatment parameter, whereas quality assurance is a procedure that verifies the entire process, is, 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 uh, that the quality goals for that process is, are being met. So sort of in a, a diagram here, uh, where you see, for example, a process which has multiple inputs, a quality control or QC procedure might be established to make sure that that particular input is done correctly. And if not, then we know that there's something wrong there. So you might have multiple QC procedures, uh, whereas after the process is done and the output is there, you can do a quality assurance type of evaluation to make sure that everything looks okay. The advantage of doing quality assurance, of course, is that you only have one test to make at the end of it. The disadvantage is if it goes wrong, you have to go back to see what went wrong. And you may not know where the error lies. So the, what is the motivation for uh, this new type of approach? Well, there's several problems with traditional 
uh, quality management approaches such as in TG40 or TG142. And that is, one of them is there's an excessive demand on physics resources. There are a number of modern technologies that are out that have very complex and lots of components, and the physicists are being strapped to be able to do QA on all of these types of devices. And a lot of times it's not necessary if those devices are not used in the way that the quality assurance measurement is testing. Uh, there's also a delay in quality management protocols. When task groups are created, sometimes it takes years before they produce a report. And many times, it really, in order to produce a, a report that's of importance or of significance to the community, the people that are the authors have to have had a lot of experience on the new technology, but that takes a while before they decide what's important to test and what's not. Um, most importantly, I would the third bullet is that no quality management protocol covers all permutations of practice. So typical quality management programs really cover things like linear accelerators, where there's only a few types of those uh, that exist on the market right now. Whereas if you go to any particular clinic, their procedures vary from clinic to clinic to clinic. And those variations in procedures can cause differences in potential failures. So TG100 methodology was, rather than a retrospective approach, which, uh, which is to look back and see what errors existed and how to prevent those errors, is to do a prospective approach. Look at exactly what your process is and see what errors could occur and then create quality, pro quality management programs which will prevent that or reduce that risk. So there's an emphasis in the report on a team approach, that is all staff that are involved in the procedures or will participate in a, in a TG100 type of process. And there are three quality management tools that are used. Well, process mapping, failure mode, and effects analysis, there's an error right there, and uh, fault tree analysis. And we're going to talk about all three of these now. So we'll start with the process map. So by definition, it is an illustration of the temporal relations between different steps in a process. So if you have a particular procedure, you start from the first, the first step in that process, and you step through and look at every, every step that takes place in that procedure and what happens. Now this may be displayed graphically in a tree or in a flowchart diagram, or it can be simply labeled as an outline as we did at our facility. So we looked at a, a fairly simple flowchart earlier in Mike's talk, this is one from TG100, which is a little bit more complex. And this is straight from the report. But this was the example of the committee was to look at an IMRT process and go through at each step of the IMRT process and label each step. And there were uh, 216 steps in this particular process. And uh, there were 15 major uh, steps. So the way this is divide, designed is it flows from left to right. So this is the branch, or sorry, the, the main um, the, the branch of the tree, these are the bows, or the boughs, sorry, of the major six, for, so for example, the first one would be patient database information is entered, immobilization and positioning and so forth, until we get all the way to the end when the final treatment takes place. And within each of these boughs, we can break those down into sub-steps that occur for each of these. So the first time, for example, a physician uh, creates a treatment planning directive, uh, they have to specify the images used for target delineation, and there are a lot of steps that correspond to each of those. So the idea is to go through each of these processes and identify what that, what that process is uh, for, that, for your particular clinic, and this can vary from site to site. Here's another example of a flowchart, and this is from a paper by Eric Ford at Hopkins a, a few years ago, where they looked at the flowchart for image-guided radiation therapy, and this was just one aspect of it. And rather than uh, using that uh, tree diagram that was used on the previous one, they used a flow chart, which had a yes or no uh, sequence where they would go, okay, was this DR approved? Yes, it goes here. If it wasn't approved, then we go to billing or the DRR is corrected, et cetera. So, um, and that's another way of outlining how, how a process could, could take place. So once you have a process set up, then the next step is to do a failure mode and effects analysis, or FMEA. And in an FMEA, what you do is you go through and in each step of the process map, you identify all potential failure modes. What could go wrong in this step? Okay? Then you identify the root causes for each failure mode. Why would this happen? And then you numerically rank each failure mode using what's called a risk priority number, or an RPN. And that is a product of three separate numbers. There's an O, which stands for occurrence, S is severity, and D is called detected rateability, or lack of detection. Now these numbers uh, represent, O represents the probability that this could occur, with a higher number being more probable. S is the severity, the higher number is more severe as the error if it does occur. 
and d is the probability that it would be detected if this occurred somewhere later on down the road. So for example, if you entered the wrong patient ID number into the database system, and then as you go back later on, and that you might be uh, treating or planning for a different patient, it might be found by somebody later on when they're looking at a record or something, and they say, oh, the wrong number's in there. So there's a certain likelihood that that might be found later on, and that would prevent the error from occurring. So you, the idea is that the risk is proportional to the product of all three of these numbers. Now, these numbers are given a scale, and they, they're numbered from 1 to 10, so the maximum would be 1,000, and the minimum would be 1. So, and typically, numbers less than 100 are usually ignored. The risks that are not significant enough to pay attention to, and the ones that are higher are the ones that you really need to adapt to your quality management program to make sure you prevent those risks. And this is a table that came from TG100 that shows exactly how these numbers are assigned. So these are in 10 uh, rows. So for example, um, for a, a probability or a occurrence probability of, of 1, that would be a probability of occurring of 0.01, or 1 in 10,000 probability of occurring. Okay? Uh, the significance, the severity of 1 would have no effect. It would range all the way to 10, the catastrophic. And the probability of detecting or going undetected ranges from uh, 0.01 also to about greater than 20% of uh, not being uh, detected as it goes through the steps. So it's interesting that, in general, a lot of people, when they do general risk analysis, a lot of quality management protocol or quality uh, management retrospective ones are really based to prevent high catastrophic, high severity errors. But in reality, uh, most of the errors, as you go to very catastrophic type severity, then uh, the, prob uh, the probability of that occurring is fairly low. So what's plotted here is a, a typical error which might occur, uh, this is sort of a hypothetical error, and it's sort of a continuous error, like for example, the, the machine is miscalibrated, and what is the percent the machine is miscalibrated? Well, this might be the percent error in dose delivered. And so the severity of the patient would go up the further the machine is miscalibrated, so the S value goes up to it gets to a factor of 10, but the probability that it would occur actually drops, and as well as the probability that it would be detected, or that it wouldn't be detected, also drops. So the product of those numbers, the risk priority number green, actually peaks at, low, at uh, lower values of severity, where it's a small enough increase that it's not going to be detected, but it's still going to cause damage to the patient. So the idea behind the, this theoretical RPN value is that the more important errors that you're looking at are errors that are not necessarily catastrophic to the patient, but can do, can do damage. So here's a typical FMEA example from the IMRT example that was done in PG100. So the major process, patient database information, and we actually, uh, the step is the entry of uh, patient data into the electronic database. And we've been incorrect. The, problem, the failure mode is we put the wrong patient ID in. Okay, what happened? Well, there was an error in the manual entry. It wasn't sent over from the um, ADT interface. It was just manually put in, and they put the wrong number. What's the result of the failure? Now, one of the things that, uh, that can occur is a result from that could be just inconvenience for the patient. They call the wrong patient or some, a number of minor things. But in this case, uh, one thing that might happen is that, uh, that we actually deliver the very wrong dose because we have the wrong patient ID. You know, if the wrong patient come, uh, comes in, we check their ID as the wrong patient, we give them the wrong dose. So with, the, with this, each of the members of the, t of the task group committee went through for each of these steps and evaluated and said, what is the probability that I think that would occur? What is the severity if it does occur? And what is the probability it wouldn't be detected? And the values for average occurrence uh, probability was a close to a four, which is about a one in a thousand chance of that happening. And uh, the probability that it would be detected is maybe one in a hundred for a factor of four. So it's a fairly low probability uh, thing that would happen. Not that uh, the numbers couldn't be entered in incorrectly, but that it would result in a very wrong dose, the probability was pretty low. In fact, I, I, I thought that was a little high in general for the average. Of course, the severity in this case is pretty high because if you treat to the wrong dose, that, that could be fairly damaging. But the product of the RPN is, ends up being the product of these three numbers is around 100, which is sort of borderline. We really don't have to worry about this and, and really to change our quality management program to deal with this particular error. Uh, another thing that's discussed in TG100 is a fault tree analysis, and I'm not going to spend too much time for this, but this is basically taking your process map and flipping it around, 
and saying, okay, what are potential errors that could occur? And let's go backwards and figure out what, what occur, why these occur. For example, you might look at uh, there's a wrong dose distribution to the volume for doing an RTP anatomy failure, and maybe that was because, because the physician contoured the wrong GTP. Well, what could cause that? So there are a number of things that could cause that. So there's sort of this OR gate here that would show, well, they, they contoured the wrong organs, okay? Or other potential failure, failures that would cause them to have the wrong structures on the planning system. Well, why did they contour the wrong organs? Well, maybe they were in a hurry. They failed to review it. There wasn't enough staff. Um, there was, they didn't get enough information on the design of the treatment of the scenario and so forth. So there's a number of, in all of these, you can keep going back and back and back until you get uh, to areas that are actually outside of your control. Now, the advantage of uh, fault tree analysis is you can add QA steps to them. So you say, okay, well, there's errors in the calculated value of those for a patient. Well. That would occur if we have QA, then there's an error in the calculation, but we also do QA, so there must have been an error in QA as well. So this is a, a, a real nice way of saying, okay, we can put quality assurance in here to prevent these things from happening and put show them graphically in the fault tree. Okay, so the summary of recommendations from TG100 is this is how you do it for a, a particular clinic. First, you define the process, you assemble a multidisciplinary team, you develop a process map. You for, perform an FMEA risk assessment with this each step. You identify the failure modes for each step. You identify the potential causes and then the effects for each failure mode. And then you do an FMEA assessment. You identify the current, current process controls, what your current quality management program is, how it affects this. You determine the failure likelihood. You calculate the risk priority number. And then you identify the failure modes with the highest RPNs. And then you develop new process controls. Fairly straightforward process. Right? The recommendations were for individual clinics that every clinic should develop a risk analysis quality management program, key personnel should attend, and you begin with high risk procedures like SBRT, and you should do it on an ongoing basis. And they also recommended that future task groups should use FMEA. I think that's extremely important uh, when they're deciding uh, these are the recommendations for what types of safety you need to do, what types of quality management. They should also do FMEA so that they're not assigning uh, physicists to do too many tasks that really aren't important to establishing quality for patients. Uh, they want to assist users with implementation, establishing a work group to provide user guides, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And they want to work with other societies to promote risk-based quality management programs. And then they have a whole slew of recommendations for regulators, and this was a real controversial issue within the task group and science council because there was a lot of concern about how this would be handled by regulators. For those of you who were around when TG40 came into play, there was a lot of problems with regulators coming into clinics and saying, you should be following every step that's in TG40. Um, you know, and uh, a lot of clinics were, were, a lot of people were upset about that. So they wanted to make sure that regulators, uh, were, that this report was not intended for regulatory purposes. So. Now, the report was published in 2013. Um, and after that, there have been some other efforts. Uh, I want to mention some briefly. There's a group out of Canada that was had by, had, uh, set up originally by Peter Dunscombe, but there's uh, Sasha Munich and uh, Todd Palicki and uh, Derek Brown, four uh, physicists that got together and said, you know, we need to help people uh, implement the types of ideas that are in TG100. You can go to their website, treatsafely.com, uh, or .org, if, if, anyway, .org. And uh, they actually go to facilities, they went to a lot of users' meetings, and, uh, chapter meetings and things, and uh, give presentations on how to do your own FMEA analysis or your own fault tree analysis. And we're really set up to help uh, individuals train to learn how to do some of these prospective quality uh, management techniques. And we had them come to our facility when I was formerly at uh, Mary Bird Perkins. Uh, we got a grant from the Louisiana Hospital Foundation uh, to, to implement or to have these folks come in and do a workshop. So they came for two days and over a weekend. We had everyone in our facility come. We also had a, a, a large residency program that was uh, distributed amongst uh, three other hospitals. And all of their residents and physicists came as well. So we had a, about 100 people that came to this approach. And it was a very worthwhile weekend. They came in and they showed everyone how to do, you know, do a basic process map and, um, and just to implement some simple ideas, um, and I thought it worked, worked very well. I don't know if you worked. 
there for that. I don't know if you were. Was that accurate? I'm not sure. But um, regardless, this was the group there. So uh, these guys, a lot of the guys that are involved in that have been involved in uh, the APM Working Group, which was established shortly after TG100 was published. And again, the, the idea is that we really want to create uh, educational training materials for those people who want to use TG100. Um, and they have done that. And um, what they've done is a couple of things. First of all, they've done a number of workshops. They've had seven national workshops in the APM in the last four years. They've had over 450 people go to these workshops, and maybe some of you have as well. They also have, uh, have uh, subcommittees under their committee that are set, set up to provide an implementation guide a repository. They've got, uh, if you go on the APM website, one of the tabs at the top is quality and safety, and it goes to their implementation guide. There's several links here. Some of them are linked to IROC Houston and so forth, but the first one is an implement, a set of four implementation guide videos. They're about six minute videos. Uh, they're worth watching. Um, and uh, for $100, if you write a quiz on the videos, you can see them <laughs> But they'll, uh, they talk on how to develop process maps, failure mode effects analysis, FTA, and quality management. So these are already available on the APN's website. Okay. So the last few minutes, I want to talk about how we did this in our facility. Oshner um, Health System is a facility that was started in 1942 by a group of physicians headed by Alton Oshner, Oshner and uh, has grown tremendously, uh, especially since Katrina. Uh, Oshner uh, has purchased, uh, purchased about three, th three hospitals right after Katrina, and now has expanded all over the Gulf South. They have over 14 hospitals that they own or partner with. Uh, right now, radiation oncology is, is only in three sites. Um, most of the patients are treated in New Orleans at the main center, which is displayed here. But we treat about 1,000 new patients a year, 100 patients a day uh, at three sites. There are four uh, physicians, four physicists, Four dosimetrists, it must be four of everything. We have four Linux. Um, I think we have four nurses too. Well, we have more therapists. But, uh, but anyway, um, and we're pretty much an all varying site. So the thought was that uh, we should implement this uh, in our facility or go through this process as TG100 recommended. Um, in part, as, as co author and, and a, a big proponent of this, I thought this would be worthwhile. And uh, we were also thought this would be a good project because uh, we were coming for a credit accreditation with ACR, and they specifically asked for what type of quality improvement projects. And I can't think of a better quality improvement project that you would have in going through this process here. So, uh, so this this I was very happy with how this worked for our department. I wasn't quite sure how this was going to work in a small a small environment like this, but it was very very useful. So we from a period of May through August of this year. We decided that we would evaluate one particular procedure, and that was SBRT for lung. And we established a multidisciplinary team. We had one physician, uh, three physicists, three dosimetrists, two therapists, a nurse, and our manager. And we met about five or six times uh, over lunch, usually a long lunch period, uh, maybe about once every other week or so. Uh, and we went through, and the first thing we did is we developed a process map, and that took about two meetings. Uh, where we would go through and uh, itemize each step in the process. Uh, everybody would contribute, but we do this, we do this. And it was a very good learning experience because a lot of people didn't really know all the aspects of what the patients were going through uh, throughout the entire process, their procedure. So uh, then the second uh, step was once we identified the process map, then we went through each process, each step, and identified potential failure modes. Uh, and that took about two meetings. Um, it was one of the things that we did do is we tried to filter out those types of failure modes that we thought would be, we knew that the RPM value was going to be pretty small, so we didn't include it. So instead of 283 failure modes that uh, TG100 had, I think we had uh, 66 or something like that within our group. Uh, after we finally came up with all the failure modes, we put these in a spreadsheet and then sent them around to all the, uh, the participants in the group and ask them to estimate the RPM values individually. So they would estimate the probability of occurrence, the severity, as well as the, um, the probability it wouldn't be detected. And we gave them the chart and said, this is your, if you think it's a 1% one one chance, you look at 1%, and that's a, a probability of occurrence of 6, and so forth. So when it did an example, and they all went away, and we wanted this to be independent for everybody to sort of uh, estimate it on their own. And what, we, what I found was that when we got the results back, there was actually a wide range of uh, numbers. In, in general, 
most people that weren't familiar with the process, I thought, underestimated the probability of these things occurring. So most of our RPMs were pretty low. But what was important, though, was that the relative risks between individuals were pretty constant. So uh, perhaps the nurses thought that, uh, in general, the RPMs, their average RPM might have been 80, and the physicists, the average RPM might have been 250. But in general, the nurses and the physicists both thought that the particular failure mode was the one that was the riskiest. So that was useful for us because then we decided those are the ones that we really do need to approach. Um, then we would rank the, F, the failure modes. We uh, have a product to find out what the, the highest failure modes were. And then we met together for a meeting to discuss those, uh, those highest risk failure modes and what we can do about it. So again, 50, our process map had 50 major steps, 84 sub-processes. We had eight members that ranked them. And one of the things we also did is we people didn't rank all the processes. If you didn't know enough about the process, you just left it blank. And we made sure that, uh, that everybody didn't feel intimidated. Like, how am I going to know whether the dose calculation algorithm was wrong? Well, you don't have to do that. Physicists will do that one, but don't you do the rest of it. Uh, we had 71 failure modes identified. Um, and we ended up with six processes that had an, an average RPM greater than 100. So we decided to look specifically at those. And uh, these were the uh, SBRT process map that we came up with. And it's very similar to the process map that, um, that TG100 came uh, for IMRT because a lot of the general processes that took place, for example, CT simulation, 4D CT, other imaging transfer images, those all are consistent whether you're having SBRT or IMRT. So the major categories were more or less the same as that within TG100. And that was a very a great benefit for us in establishing this process map by referring back to that. Um, so here were the failure modes, uh, just an example of some of the failure modes that we came up, or at least the spreadsheet that we came up with. So for example, immobilization and positioning, patients check in for serum. They're not checked into RA or EPIC. Well, what's the effects of that? Well, there's a delay or there's building problems. So that's a pretty low, there's almost nothing. The, the severity is just an inconvenience perhaps to the staff. It's an RPM of 15. And these are the average RPM values that we got from the entire group. And uh, as you can see, in all of these cases, all of them are fairly small. This one is fairly high. The lasers are inaccurate. The patient setup is incorrect. Uh, the probability of occurrence is pretty low probability. Um, and looks like it's a pretty high probability that somebody is going to detect that. But that's a little bit on the higher side. Um, so we identified six. Uh, failure modes that we thought, well, we need to look at these, and I've just uh, listed uh, three of them here. One of them was that uh, the patient would move after their marks were placed in CT simulator. So basically the way our process was, to, or was, is that the patients are put on the CT table, they are marked where the lasers are for the isocenter, then they go through the whole scanning process, which takes multiple times because we do a 4D scan as well as a conventional sim. We have to sometimes take quite some time before the simulation scan is done. And the argument, the problem was, is that perhaps they've moved off their, off their laser, lasers by the, end of the, uh, by the end of their treatment. So the idea was that, well, it might not be that significant because we're going to do image guidance on these patients before we treat them. But if the area that we want to treat is difficult to visualize, then we may not, it may go undetected. So this ended up with an RPM value of 141. And we talked about it, and our solution was that, well, let's just institute a procedure that we recheck the marks after the CT is complete. And if they've moved, then, we, then we'll have to do a rescan if necessary. So that's a very simple solution, but it's one that we hadn't implemented. Maybe everybody else in this room is doing it, but we weren't. And so this is something that we've now implemented in our clinic, and now we look and make sure that the marks are okay. This is a very simple, you know, it doesn't have to be rocket science, like we develop a new algorithm to go in and check this out or the other. Sometimes it's a very simple solution. This was another one. Uh, the argument was the failure mode was that the patient moves after the cone beam CT. So the patient comes in for treatment. We do a cone beam CT. We make sure they're in the right position. And we shift them accordingly. And then what happens? Well, we call the physician. And then the physician comes and looks at it and makes sure it's OK. Well, at our facility, they call the physicians after they got the CT done. And the physicians took forever. It would be like 10 minutes before they'd come over there. Our physicians are very adamant. They're not coming to check somebody, their partner's CT. So you have to get that particular physician. The argument was that this is a very high probable that they could move afterwards. So 
the, the idea was that, well, let's call the phys physician before you do the Comey CT so that if there is any delay, there, you know, that reduces the amount of delay. And if you wait after five minutes, then you have to read Comey CT. So we institute that as our, uh, in our policies, and that eliminated that problem. Uh, the last one was simply the idea that the physician contours the wrong area. Okay? And typically, the contours are reviewed when we do our, our uh, uh, chart rounds, which are or treatment planning rounds, which occur once a week. And sometimes they do get changed. The problem is that they only give five treatments, sometimes even three treatments with our SBRT. And if we've already given one or two, and then they get reviewed at our planning site, and they decide that they're wrong, or they didn't cover enough, or something like that, there's, we've already done a significant, given a substantial amount of dose to something that we shouldn't have, or should have modified. So all we, this was a very simple solution here. We just make sure that we review the target bodies by the other staff before we treat the patient. So now we've changed our scheduling. So the simulator therapist who schedules the patient knows that the patient can't start until after the Tuesday chart run. So nobody starts until after their plans are reviewed on Tuesday. So none of these changes are very significant as far as conceptually. They're pretty obvious. But they're something that we just hadn't come up with in our facility until we all got together and went through this process. So in conclusion, TG100 differs from the traditional methods and its recommendations for of a prospective approach to quality management. It delivers three tools for developing quality management program process mapping, an FMEA, and a fault tree analysis. And there are a number of TG100 resources available for free on the APM website. I encourage you to check those out. It can be performed very easily in a small clinic. And changes in procedures of the quality management 